Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today with this inspiring group of creators, producers, entrepreneurs from across the globe. We're going to discuss how holograms and volumetric capture is transforming music and the arts. Um, my name is Amy Lemire. I'm currently one of two managing partners at the WXR Fund. We invest in VR, AR, and AI early stage companies across all industries that have a strong female founder, female leadership. I've been in the immersive space for about five years and have always had a special interest in virtual music technology. In fact, I started attending and writing about virtual concerts in 2016, and I'm an advisor and an angel investor in, to companies like Tribe and Stage First and Overview Arc. I used to see hundreds, like a hundred live concerts a year. So with the pandemic, virtual music is even more important to me. And what these people have been creating, I've seen all of it. Um, it's just fantastic to have them here to discuss how they're seeing this space transform. Hello everyone, this is Jin Su, the head of mixed reality and gaming business in SK Telecom. Uh, since the very first commercialization of 5G network in uh, 2019, we have been fortunate enough to introduce Jump, our AR and VR service to customers. At the moment, we are focusing on creating super realistic volumetric content through our mixed reality capture studio, Jump Studio. You can see, it's very nice to see you all and I really look forward to listening to all of your story. Thank you. Uh, th these videos are uh, all the captured in our Jump Studio, volumetric capture studio, and then we use these contents in various areas, not just in concert, and then in the AR and VR services also. So you can meet many K-pop stars and artists and celebrities from Korea. My name is Jason Waski. I'm a creative director with the Mixed Reality Capture Studio team, and we focus on the capture, processing, and playback of volumetric video, where we license the technology to folks like Jinsu uh, at SKT that jump, uh, that we make sure that we are enabling creators, uh, like Asad, who's going to talk, who's going to introduce himself in a moment, give them the ability to capture uh, actions and performances with true volume, with space and depth, uh, to create something that is novel and new. Um, our mission is to empower creators to make holographic video for just about every device. And you can see here just a little bit of the taste of how we capture real performances and real people and turn them into holograms that can be consumed in a variety of experiences. My name is Asad J. Malik. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Jadu. Um, we make a bunch of holograms uh, using the technology that Jason just described um, of musicians. So we're capturing mu musical performances and um, allowing the user to be a, basically have them in their own living spaces using devices that they have access to. And uh, a lot of our background is in more narrative storytelling and augmented reality. Um, so we're trying to kind of build that, bring that narrative element um, of our past work into the music industry uh, through our app and actually produce experiences that people have on their phones. Okay. So one of the things that we're building now um, is a first experience that will be available on the Jadu app. Um, we've been working with a band called Palais Royale and they, they had a sold out tour in Europe um, last year that got canceled because of COVID. So this is a very interesting new way of us to help actually bring a musical performance with them to their audience. And here's a trailer of the experience, Curse of Calypso.
Jinsu, you've been in this um, immersive space for almost a decade now. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey and, and what you're working on now? Um, uh, I think immersive technology brought dramatic changes to the music and art industry last year compared to the previous 10 years. Uh, in the past, if the fans wanted to meet their favorite stars, they had to go to the visit physically go to the concert or watch them through the traditional media platforms such as TV or YouTube. With COVID-19 as a turning point, fans are now able to coexist in the same location with their stars through AR and VR technology. Volumetric capture technology was used many times for the purpose in online and offline concerts last year in Korea. For example, uh, BTS member Suga appeared as a hologram at the Asian version of the music award MAMA, and more K-pop stars like DJ Raiden, Shiwon Che, and The Boys shocked their fans by appearing as a giant or multiple clones at the same time in their concert. Furthermore, entire new con contents are sh showcased in the market, such as SM Entertainment, Aspar, new type of K-pop stars. The members not only exist in real world, but also exist in virtual world, world as their own customized avatar, too. Previously, the general public had little access to that cutting-edge technology before, but now, Immersive technology has uh, quenched their thirst. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely been an interesting time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason, I believe you and I met when I was preparing to be captured for my first hologram. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and what you're focusing on now uh, as sure. part of Microsoft. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Jason. I'm a creative director here at Microsoft where I've been part of the volumetric video scene for I'm in my 11th year now, so just a little bit over a decade. Um, and when we talk about volumetric and we talk about holograms, what we're really talking about, especially when we talk it comes to immersive experiences for VR and AR, we're really talking about technology that allows us to focus multiple cameras in and capture a real subject, a real person doing a real thing. Um, it's slightly different than say some of the avatar based stuff that we've seen in that, uh, if a person flubs something, uh, if they do something unique in that moment, we are able to capture that and replay it back in both uh, augmented reality or virtual reality experiences. For us, for, for Microsoft, what we've been focusing on really is trying to unlock and empower creators like Saad, like uh, Jinsu, and able to be able to make interesting and new compelling experiences with this, this kind of stuff. And it's been extra exciting or extra involving because of COVID, because there's really been a hunger to drive new experiences. Um, I think we've been from the very earliest days, we've looked to music, to performance and the arts to really help drive the potential of a novel and emerging mediums. And we've been doing the captured version where we record a subject uh, for in 3D for quite a while. Uh, I think you've started to see that hunger for the live concert experience that you were mentioning, Amy, is starting to come to the forefront. You've seen just over the last few months, Microsoft uh, has been hosting concerts in alt space. So Diplo, Pitbull, uh, to try to get some of that live feel back of what it's like to be with other people uh, at a venue. But across the board, what we are really excited to do is to empower creators to bring sort of holographic video, to bring volumetric uh, video to, to different people, to different platforms. That's great. And uh, what's also really interesting about this uh, holograms and, and volumetric is it's not just a virtual reality experience, right? You don't have to have a headset to consume it. You can also consume it on devices that we own, like mobile and laptop and tablets. So it's really accessible for, for all people, which I think is great. Um, Asad, I've been following your career for a while now. It took a significant turn over the past year or so. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been up to? Sure. Um, so I think my background is not exactly in music. Um, we were doing a bunch of very narrative driven projects um, in this space with vo using volumetrics, especially in augmented reality. Um, so we had a project called Terminal 3 that was at Tribeca in 2018. 
and then we had a, a justice tale at Sundance. And I think for me, honestly, the big thing has been that um, I just realized that there isn't distribution for this kind of stuff. Um, and the traditional distributors that exist out there don't quite know what to do with it. Um, you know, when we had pieces at Sundance and Tribeca, there was a lot of excitement around our projects. And, you know, I really thought that they were going to actually reach audiences outside the festival circuit as well. And whenever we actually got into conversations, either it would be with, um, you know, like uh, platform providers like Magically, for example, we had uh, our project was on Magically Petset, Adjuster's Tale. Or when we were talking to documentary film distributors, there was always something that would actually end up stopping the conversation. So, for example, magically, they weren't ready to really have content that didn't feel like it was the friendliest possible content. You know, like there is a tendency often for tech companies to want to make um, stuff that is um, safe. Um, so, I think part of why we took the trajectory that we are on right now is that. We thought we should make our own platform. We should figure out our own ways of distributing the content that we f find is useful in this medium that we think audiences actually enjoy that doesn't have to be dictated by you know, what a publicly traded com company thinks would be good. Um, and I think that we try to kind of find that freedom for ourselves. And a good starting point was the music industry because um, that's really a place where you have a use case where you have artists that need to promote their albums, they need to produce, uh, they need to promote, you know, the music that they're putting out there. Um, they don't really have that much, uh, you know, channels for revenue anymore because of streaming and obviously because of COVID, the concert cycle really stopping, um, you know, as we've all noticed, really brought a lot more attention towards these new mediums. So uh, we have an app called Jadu, um, which over the last year or so, the primary a uh, use case has been that we can do user-generated videos. Um, fans can actually get into the video of the artist, and the end result really looks like both the fan and the artist were in the video together. Uh, there are a bunch of creation tools we've added on top of that that you know you can use. You can apply effects onto the holograms or record in more interesting modes. Um, but what I'm most excited about is what we're doing right now, which is we're also kind of working towards bringing more elaborate musical experiences uh, through our platform to consumers. Uh, we're launching our first experience, Curse Calypso, uh, next month on the 9th. That's something you know we can dive into maybe in a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It, it, it's, it's been fun to, um, to experience what and to see what people have done with Jadu. Um, maybe going back to you, Jinsu, or, or Jason, what, uh, what other ways are you seeing fans interact with the music and, and with artists using using this immersive media? Uh, 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 the, the, when we worked with the uh, music artist, uh, the, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, due to the COVID-19, the opportunity for fans to interact with their stars abruptly ended, you know? Fans cannot participate in meet and greet session with their favorite sports star and artist. No, they can not visit the concert of their favorite artist. So in order to overcome such hurdles, uh, we have taken various use cases into account when Jump Studio kicked off since the last year. So uh, we collaborated with baseball teams to create volumetric con contents of players so fans could meet them in their daily lives in the, at their home. So uh, we also collaborated with the sports reality TV show called Witches, uh, which is about building the baseball team and famous Korean celebrity go through various challenges. Fans were so pleased with watch their stars right in front of them through Junk AR, our AR service, and having a fan meeting in the virtual world, Junk VR too. So that was our experience. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Jason, how about you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I think a lot about um, as media has grown, you know, we're used to having the things that we watch kind of served up to us, and it's a fairly passive experience. Mm -hmm. um, having content that is a little bit more like the way we experience the real world, which means that it's it's spatialized, it's got depth, it's got volume, 
that actually allows for having more interesting and engaging experiences with content. And I think we've seen that come through uh, in some of the work that, that Jadu did, where you get up close to the performers, um, you become part of their performance. Uh, we've seen that in other immersive spaces where just that sense of by breaking you out of what you're used to, you have a deeper connection to the content. Um, we've seen that, whether that be in Unreal Engine, like the Travis Scott and Fortnite uh, kind of components, uh, whether we've seen it in Allspace, we did Burning Man, I think to the point making that like, you know, we're Microsoft uh, going to exciting new places and making new, having technology support broad and interesting new use cases is actually the exciting part. Um, for volumetric side, again, it's really about bringing people closer to the creators and to the performance itself, whether that's music, whether that's sports, uh, as soon as you mentioned, uh, whether it's stuff like Cirque du Soleil. Um, I think COVID has really made an opportunity for people to be more interested and excited for those opportunities, but we've been playing with it now, again, for, for almost a decade. I think that core human need and desire of seeing content that has volume and depth and being more interested in that, that's a, that's a real key human need that we're needing. Meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about with the particularly Burning Man in alt space VR, which is um, owned by Microsoft. It was acquired by Microsoft several years ago. Uh, Diplo was in there, and I think he he that was a volumetric experience, and uh, you could tell that he could see when the avatars in the audience were giving him like heart emojis, right? You could see, you could feel. I mean, he even talked about it, right? So, so you could tell that there was this interaction between the musician and the fan, which was great, and but yet all virtual. Um, so that so that that's that's a fun ex that was a fun experience. Yeah, um, I, I would say. I think, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, mean, just, yeah. I think you hit the, the key of the thing is that ideally what we're working to is a future where we can have that direct engagement and that Diplo experience is a, is a really good example of that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, the other alt space experience that I that comes to mind for me is Reggie Watts, who is a, you know not only a musician, but a, a comedian. And uh, he had uh, an ongoing weekly series where he would engage with the audience and tell jokes and sing songs and, virtually serve us drinks at a virtual bar um and that you know the, you know the to be able to engage he would interview the avatars the people that were attending the fans um so to be able to engage at that level with uh, musicians and artists is uh it's truly special and it's truly something that just doesn't um uh, is hard to replicate if you're not doing it virtually <coughs> Maybe um, I'm curious to hear, speaking of artists, what has been the reaction of some of the artists that you've worked with as they start to engage with this new um, emerging technologies of holograms and volumetric capture? Maybe you could tell us a, a story or two about some of the people that you've worked with and how they've reacted to it. Yeah, we actually, we collaborated with many artists and celebrities in Korea. Every time we introduce our technology, the artists are fascinated by things we deliver. So uh, I think they seem to be very excited about by countless potential these volumetric contents can bring to the table. The artists always tell me that new technology makes them more enthusiastic and proactive because it allows them to feel like they are pioneers of emerging era. So many artists who has, uh, have once experienced this uh, pre pretty uh, special experience, they came again. Yeah, I mean, they are pioneers. So that's, the, I'm glad they're feeling that. Yeah. Asad, how about you? You've worked with a lot of artists over the past year. Yeah, I think we are at a good 60, 70 artists over the last year. So it's it's definitely been, uh, we've been churning them out for sure. Um, actually had the real pleasure of working with Lil Nas X this Sunday. Um, we recorded something that hopefully will be out over the next couple of weeks. Um, obviously, you know, that's an artist that has very much the right type of audience that engages with this kind of work um, and is familiar with game kind of language and whatnot. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because we went in with some sense of what creative we were going for. We were just recording a 15 to 20 second uh, memeable kind of hologram. And obviously Lil Nas X is supposed to be like a meme lord, like truly, you know, he 
memed himself into superstardom where now he has literally the most streamed song of all time just because he was able to capitalize on TikTok and that meme economy. So my prompt to him is very much like, you know, make something you think you can meme with. Um, and, you know, so that's kind of what we went in with. And he got very excited, spent an hour pacing around trying to figure out what the best way to do this would be. Um, and, you know, we, we did something that at the end of the day feels pretty mundane and casual, but um, sometimes that's kind of what needs to work. So I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with that release and, you know, um, the kind of audience we reach for that. Um, and I think uh, one of the other things I would say about working with artists is that, you know, this is a new medium. People do get very excited um, when they get there and there is certain novelty value. Um, but the best is when you're working the second or third time with an artist. And that really came through for us when we started working on Curse of Calypso, which is, you know, the experience that we're releasing, which is a lot more elaborate. You know, it's a 10 minute long thing. We've recorded dozens of holograms that are kind of forming up the experience. There are a bunch of interactions, both with the viewer and with the space. Um, Amy, you got to try it. You were mentioning, you know, there's like a piano scene where the user can play this piano that the hologram also gets to play. So um, the reason we were able to pull that off was because we had actually recorded with that band before a year ago. And so they had a sense of what they were getting themselves into. And because the medium was just not about novelty anymore, we actually could sit down and really make something that was, I think, like an experienced result. Like it was, our team has been doing this for a few years now, you know, the volumetric capture team at Metastase that we work with, they've been doing it for a while. We have a really strong synergy with them. You know, we have we speak our own language on set, and we're able to achieve things very quickly. Everyone knows what's happening, and I think that that's really like where the exciting stuff happens, where you go beyond the initial novelty and excitement and really get into uh, getting unique experiences made because you know how to do it now, and the artist knows how to do it now, and they have a good idea of how they're going to tackle this very very new medium. Um, yeah. Right. So after they become, you know, after they experience it the first time and they're, they're the pioneers, eventually it's going to become more comfortable medium for them and potentially, you know, the creativity then expands at that point, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so only only better things to come, which it sounds like. It, you know, it's interesting when I, I hear that, 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 that talk about having people who've been on stage and experienced it once before, because the truth is it's kind of a conceptual hurdle to get over the first time. And people are kind of used to seeing themselves on camera one way or the other. Um, but volumetric holographic experiences really require an artist or performer to occupy space. Um, and it's why sometimes like the co-creation aspects where you're like you're filming yourself with a hologram is interesting because it's you moving in space. But we've really seen that people who fully understand how their bodies move, so it's dancers, that's gymnasts, that's performers, that's people who do or have a component of their live show that's really strong, that how they occupy space, how they play to an audience, that we can capture elements of that that aren't really possible to capture very well um, in that 2D yeah. sense. I think you mentioned Diplo. Like a DJ, watching a DJ, it's you, you want to be in the crowd, you're feeling the energy exchange between you and the artists and people around you. That's hard to do. It's hard to experience EDM if you're just sitting watching it on TV. Um, it's a lot more, it's a lot deeper, more direct connection when you're doing that immersively. And I think that volumetric allows for that. And it's interesting to hear that sense of the more people have been through that experience, the more you can get out of that experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes sense. Um, maybe we can shift a little bit and talk about some of the technical challenges. Again, this is a an immersive medium, and it is it is it is new technology, uh, relatively new technology. Um, I'd love to hear about some of the technical challenges you guys have overcome, and and how you've done that. Yeah, uh, I think the spectrum of AR and VR is too large to be covered by only one expert, including volumetric contents. And you know, the industry is not mature yet. And it's a kind of a convergence technology. So, you know, every step is still a challenge. So uh, we have our uh, jump service that can uh, come into play at that time. Basically, this is how we work. Uh, once we cre created volumetric contents, our user 
can receive it instantaneously because they have their own service. So we were able to overcome this difficulty through learning fast trials and error and the synergy through the collaboration, uh, including Jason's team. <laughs> So uh, we were uh, to, to uh, provide the optimal user experience. We had to go through countless trial and tribulations, and we learned priceless lessons, and which finally brought us to where we are now. So uh, the uh, applicable applicability of volumetric technology is actually boundless. So. Uh, it is no brainer for one organization to take all the burden by themselves. So, uh, it, uh, uh, per our experience, it, it was better to collaborate with specialists of each industry at the same time. Uh, this allowed us to focus on what we were good at best, and therefore uh, we created a synergy with the partner uh, while we were. Interesting. Yeah. Jason or Asad, uh, how about you? Any technical challenges that you guys have experienced but yet but overcome? Sure. Um, so we have to have overcome them in order to share. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can't overcome them all. It's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, I break down uh, the cycle there. There is creative, right? That's it has its own challenges that are tied into the volumetric technology. There are other technical challenges in terms of how things are rendered. And then there are challenges in terms of how you distribute the content as well. So, you know, one of the things, for example, uh, often artifacting in holograms and what kind of clothes and what kinds of materials would be captured well, that's always something to be concerned about. Um, you know, so we've been in scenarios where I've been like, let's not worry about this at all. Let's not burden the artist with this additional thing to worry about. Let's just let them do what they do. And if we end up with artifacting, we'll try to make it stylized somehow. So that's often the approach, but um, we've definitely ended up in scenarios where, you know, we work with an artist and we thought it's going to be a big release. And then it either didn't end up being a big release because the artist wasn't happy with how their hair looked or something. So often there are those kind of scenarios that you kind of like don't know how they're going to turn around, uh, turn out. And there are definitely limitations in terms of how the capture works. And obviously we work with Microsoft's capture tech, which is by far the cleanest we've worked with. And you know we worked with a bunch of different capture providers. Um, but even then you hit some of those limitations. So that's one side of things. Then in terms of creative, there are a lot of unique challenges that arise as well. So for example, with the gestures tale, which wasn't exactly music, but you know, we were, we were trying to get a good performance out of this child actor and the actor is nine years old and the actor has to perform to a viewer that isn't even there in this huge green screen room alone. It's very hard to form an emotional bond or, you know, give a performance that comes across as compelling. So we actually came up with this idea of hiring what we called an interactor, where we had an actor that was playing the viewer in the volumetric space to form that bond with the child actor that we would then take out of the experience and replace with actual viewer. Uh, and then the child would have that you know, connection. So it's techniques like that, that once again, you kind of, they're not that complicated. You kind of just have to figure them out and you have to want to get compelling performances in order to find these kind of solutions. Um, and there is a bunch of stuff in terms of, you know, uh, file sizes and distributing, and we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. I mean, these are more technical things, but, you know, um, we're working with 12 megapixel cameras right now, and we're rendering our holograms at 10K, 1K, which is, you know, um, volumetric terminology for uh, 10,000 polygons forming the image, and then 1K in terms of the resolution of the texture on it. Um, which is not that many polygons, and it's not that high a resolution of a, text, a texture. Like, uh, I think a lot of people render twice or thrice that quality, but we were willing to take that sacrifice so it would work smoothly on mobile without frame drops, and it's been worthwhile. And now that we have the 12 megapixel cameras at MetaState, it's really improved the quality from there. And then we're learning a bunch of things. We're not rendering normals anymore because we don't relight our holograms anyway. 
that's bringing the file sizes down. So it's a bunch of these things that we really learned over the years of how to work with that something like Curse Eclipse, so where you have you know dozens of holograms playing in a row queued up and being prepared and warmed as you wait for them, something like that becomes possible on mobile. Um, yeah. It's interesting just hearing some of the, the the stories a little bit about where those the struggles are. We're really at this this growth between moving from a technology to an artistic medium. And mm -hmm. Every artistic medium has inherent limitations in what it is, right? With, we're, we're, we're closer to where the earliest days of cinema and film, um, like uh, Lumiere, where, or Meliers, where you're actually exploring what the medium can handle and what it can do. And we, we're heard, we've heard some of those stories. I think the technology is mature enough that you can start to see artists who've worked with it for a period of time extract interesting and compelling experiences. So from Microsoft's standpoint, there was a huge gap between what is technically feasible or is technically possible in terms of we can out we can capture an output at a much higher resolution than can really currently be played back. So as an example, the difference between H.264 and H.265 is the difference between having a true 4K uh, texture map uh, or having a 4K by 3K. Why do we care about that? Because the number of pixels mean you can get up a little bit closer to things. At yeah. the end of the day, though, if you really want to, to, to engender mobile experiences or streaming experiences, we still have to be incredibly aggressive about file size. And it really gets to the heart of the issue, which is it's not that the technology doesn't serve what it needs to, because it does. It's not that you can't create really amazing, interesting, and compelling art, because you can. It gets to that next level, which is how do you distribute it, right? And we've spent... You know, we want to be as technology as not agnostic in this talk as possible, but like part of the artistry and part of the hard part is actually getting that technology to a point where it can be distributed across the widest variety of devices. So, for example, we focused on making sure that while we started our life in the HoloLens world, and that's where near and dear to our heart that we work on Magic Leap, we want to make sure that we work on iOS, that we work on Android, that uh, you can stream using our partners, that uh, Jump Studio can engender uh, a solution for that. The amount of effort that goes into supporting those components is probably half of actually the work that we do, right? We, we, we set a point where we have some understanding what the inherent limitations are. We talked about music. You can't capture drums very well. You can't capture pianos very well. I know uh, Asad and I both work with people who have played piano and trying to capture that. Um, I know you've got something coming up that you might want to talk about as far as that goes. But really at the heart of it is what we're working on is how do we distribute to as many people as we possibly can so we can get the kinds of numbers that you can see out of a Fortnite experience, but on your mobile phone. We can do it. We just have to actually uh, apply ourselves to making sure that the art is ready to go. I think the technology can support broad distribution. We're just getting to the part where people are learning how to do that part, which is its own mm -hmm. art firm in itself. I think it's going to happen. I think a lot of it's going to happen this year. Uh, I have a very good feeling. I feel like a lot of things, a lot of forces are lining up. Um, you know, we're playing our part. Everyone else is doing their thing. So, um, I mean, you know, in terms of like how when we capture our holograms, we actually put the raw data into cold storage because we totally want to render them in 4K a couple of years down the line when everything else lines up. So, you know, in fact, um, I, I directed my first music video that's coming out next month. Very happy about that um, for Pussy Riot. And it's actually all recorded in volumetric. Um, and we're rendering those holograms in 4K, 40K Polygon. So very excited to see what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, as an investor, I'm watching the ecosystem as a whole and seeing all of the components coming closer and closer together. 5G, processor speed, content engines, volumetric, headsets, you know, all of cameras on phones, like all of that is starting to come closer and closer together to see, to, to be able to support this sort of volumetric and immersive music art you know even further beyond that right just immersive space in general all of that is re is really exciting um let's uh let's go back to how you think virtual concerts and and music experiences and artistic experiences could change the in the entertainment industry as a whole right like we're in a pandemic now lots of things are virtual everybody knows what virtual is um, VR isn't that big of a jump as it used to be because because we we have all experienced video. Um, how, how do you think volumetric and holograms and and these virtual experiences will fundamentally change the industry going forward? 
Okay, I, I can say, I, I think the, uh, we, we have a uh, similar experience in entertainment area for providing concerts with the adapted volumetric contents uh, in Korea several times. So we learned that uh, from the producer's point of view, uh, it's fi uh, financially advantageous, I think. So, you know, previously offline concert to require a large amount of avoid cost, like venue and extra money and staff. And on top of that, uh, we sh the, the created, created contents related to the concert are all disposable after just one event, you know. So this led the producers to play the safe card, actually. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, virtual concerts are the opposite because they can do uh, anything they want and they imagine uh, without any uh, specific, very huge, large venue, you know. So uh, digital asset, uh, once we create it, and then they can be recycled every time they do concert, another one. Uh, and that, that's we learned, so it's very cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, another point of view, consumer's point of view, uh, you know, the accessibility and the level of satisfaction uh, is uh, pretty much increased. Uh, you know, the virtual concert can reserve the constraints of uh, offline concert, such as you should buy ticket in line and then uh, location-wise, we should go to bar to see my 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 artist. Mm -hmm. So uh, the you know and the uh, quality of the performance is different depends on the where I sit in the concert. You know, so. Uh, the virtual concert can uh, provide the uh, limited numbers of seats and everyone can enjoy the best quality performance regardless of uh, how much money they pay. You know? So uh, fans can enjoy a uh, concert anytime, any, anywhere, any place. So I think it is pretty uh, uh, evolution. Absolutely. Very powerful. Jason or Asa, did you want to jump in on that as well? Uh, I'll give Asa the last, the last word here. I think the, the interesting way, the what we're doing, what we're actually transforming here is that the experiences that are created with Volumetric, regardless of the platform you consume them on, that we're moving from novelty to ubiquity. Mm -hmm. And as we make that transformation, your viewers have a closer connection to the artist, a closer connection to the art form um, that they're that they're looking at, and that is super exciting. Um, that is an interesting thing to monetize. Uh, that's an interesting thing to build uh, fan connections. That's an interesting thing to build marketing activations around. That the core here is that once you have these experiences and once you have them on a regular basis, it is hard to go back to a flat experience. It's hard. You can still make high art films that are black and white these days, but it's more of an oddity than a regular occurrence because we're used to seeing color. We're used to having sound in the in the media that we consume. And soon we'll be used to having volume and depth. And that transformation is an opportunity for artists to make new connections uh, with their fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that I completely agree, you know. Um, I think that on one hand, you have the business side of things where um, if we look at the way content that is consumed these days, you know, on one hand, you have music, then you have movies, um, they, the model has become streaming. And that means that per content, the producers are not getting paid as much as they might have. Otherwise, um, you know, theaters are probably not going to be a thing for too long. Uh, and a bunch of these forces are aligning. So I think that there is clearly a business need for a new form of medium that is a next step that is more experiential. Um, you know, movies, you can pirate them, you can put them on YouTube if you recorded it. It's not the same with an AR experience. You kind of have to be there in order to really have a good sense of it. It, it being in your space versus you watching a video fit in someone else's space are actually drastically more different proportionally 
than watching someone else's recorded movie. Um, so that I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But then, creatively speaking, as an art form, this is the the me this is the end medium. You know, this is the the final medium. This is where it's all possible. This is you know, there's nothing beyond it really. Um, and I think that only when we complete the cycle of being able to have the artistic freedom that comes with being able to actually experience. Um, I think it will put all the other mediums in perspective where um, watching a movie would be, you know, similar to watching a painting or something. And um, which is, you know, which is an interesting idea, the way that that evolution takes place. But I think that um, there's just so much that this medium is going to unfold in terms of art and creativity and what is possible. Um, you know, just like a random point, for example, I I bring up this idea of a ghostly presence a lot. It was something that was really key to a lot of narrative work we were doing before. Um, when you have a performance in your room where your favorite artist is like breaking your wall and coming out of it and, you know, going back into it or, you know, there is all this engagement with your space. Even when you're done with that experience and you're not w watching it through your phone or your headset, the ghostly presence of those holograms is left behind their room, your room, the engaged with it. Uh, forever in your mind, you have that memory of them being there. And I think that that's just very powerful. Um, and we should be very careful with what we do with that. And we should also just be very creative with what we do with that. So, you know, very exciting time. I'm happy to be a young person right now um, working in this medium and, you know, look forward to a lifetime of developing this. Yeah, absolutely exciting time. Um, and, and particularly as we think about combining volumetric with things like AI and uh, haptics and, um, you know, just other, other technologies like that, uh, it becomes even more interesting. Uh, I want to thank you, Asad and Jinsu and Jason, for joining me in this discussion about holograms and the future of music. I really look forward to seeing what else you create. And I hope that those of you in the audience get a chance to check out some of the experience that we referenced today. And maybe you're even inspired to make your own. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.